All right, for those of you that waited here, I am strongly going to apologize because I went live and didn't go live. And so you probably waited 30 minutes and this was a huge human error here, but this is my second week of live streaming and I am a 44 year old male who's semi good at technical stuff, but not fantastic. And today is a big bit of a setback. I recorded for a while and didn't realize it was not live. I am connecting my live stream software to my YouTube channel and I thought I was live and the questions were not coming in and it was awkward. And so I was talking to nobody and I made a mistake. So if you did wait and you weren't watching and you were watching and nothing was popping up, I do apologize for wasting 30 minutes of your time because I am not a person that likes to let, make people wait. That's not my style. And so I, I apologize about that. So it was a technical difficulty and an embarrassing technical difficulty, which you guys wouldn't have known, but I figured in the spirit of honesty today and transparency, I'm going to tell you, I just recorded 20 minutes live and was not actually live. I recorded it, but it wasn't live. So I recorded it on my OBS software. Anyway, welcome to my channel. My name is Justin Mott. I am a professional photographer. My channel is dedicated to all things photography from the perspective of a full-time working professional photographer. I have a background as a photojournalist. I've shot over 100 assignments for the New York Times, but I also dabble in a lot of other things as well. I'm a commercial photographer. My wife and I own a commercial photography business called Mott Visuals, where we specialize in commercial photography and video production. We work all around Southeast Asia, all around the world, and we do a lot of hotels and resorts. So I dabble in a bit of everything. I've also even worked as a wedding photographer, and I even host my own TV show. Man, I'm a versatile dude, and I've done a lot of stuff. And um, kind of toot my own horn a bit today. Maybe I need to tone it down a bit and be a little bit more humble. So today, we're going to get juicy. We're going to get deep. I just posted a episode that I've been thinking about doing for six years. I didn't have a platform to put it out there for like maybe four of those years. But I wanted to talk about... My episode I just did was a rant about the photography industry, talking about different things that bug me. You know, I, I do this on my channel. A lot of my friends and my family are like, you're a pretty even keel guy, you're pretty mellow. I'm not. Not always. I am for the most part, but stuff bothers me and it boils and eventually it comes out. Even last night, you guys, I kind of had to yell at my neighbors because their dog has been peeing in their hallway. They let their dog out to actually pee in our hallway, an apartment building, and the dog pees in front of my house because I have two dogs. So one, my dogs go bananas. I can deal with that. But two, I can't deal with, which is their dog urinates, and I step out of my house and start my day by stepping in their dog's pee. No poop yet, pee. I've had some people suggest that I go and return the favor in front of their doorstep, not my style. Also a little bit awkward because uh, they had a whole family of multi-generations, and every time the person that I ring the doorbell to sort of scold them about it, it's like an elderly woman, so I don't want to yell at her. It's not my style, but I think that's their move. They send the old lady. Anyway, here today I'm, talk I'm here to talk about the episode that I just did. I got a lot of comments about it. I just posted that episode last night. If you haven't checked that out, I will put a link <clears throat> in the description box below if you're not watching this live. If you are watching it live and after this you want to know more about the episode because you didn't watch it, just check my recent list. Uh, you can see my last published video, and it's just basically my rant about the photography industry. But today I figure in... Because of time, I'm going to focus on the main topic that probably a lot of you are here to talk about. The topic that I got the most comments on, or just like all the comments on when I woke up this morning, are related to the Steve McCurry scandal. Now, for those of you out there that don't know what this scandal is, or for those of you out there like, why are you revisiting this six years later, I'll get into it. Before I get into that, you guys, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I've got a couple new things coming out. I will start a subscription based here, not for this stuff, not most of my, most of my content will still be free, so don't, don't run away. But I will have a subscription based for you out there industry that will start at $4.99 and you will get priority in the comment section. I will do exclusive live streams for my audience weekly. I will have a monthly photo contest just for those people that subscribe. So that will be out in the next 24 to 48 hours for those of you interested. I know a lot of people don't want to pay extra money for that stuff, but it will be a lot more extra work for me, but it will be a lot more extra content for you. So again, check that out. I will put something in the community little section there. I'll put some on my Instagram so you can subscribe to that if you're interested. It's for my YouTube channel, 499. For those of you interested in online classes, Classes, you can check those out at justinmott.com. For those of you interested in presets that add a little bit of pop to your images, they're not cloning stuff out. They're not taking things away. They're not doing unethical things in these presets. Just add a little bit of pop to your images. You can check those out at justinmott.com. Okay, let's get into what we wanted to talk about today or what I wanted to talk about and what you guys are probably here to talk about or hear me talk about. And while wow, the coffee really is kicking in right now, and that is the Steve McCurry scandal that happened years ago. I'm going to pull this up here. For those of you out there that are tuned in live, let me know how the audio sounds. Let me know how the video sounds, because again, I can see it a little bit, but I want to make sure it's going well. You know, I've got a new setup in here, tweaking things, playing around with this kind of stuff. You can see me in the background here. Maybe I need to lose, oh, lose that. Um, let's see. 
Oh, you can see my, my metrics here. Okay, I'm going to pull this up here. So what is the Steve McCurry scandal? What exactly happened? So this is many, many years ago. This happened where it came out where people caught him cloning things out of his images. As you can see here, you might say like, oh, well, what's the big deal? This was uh, one of his prints for an exhibition. And this is one of his images from Cuba. And, oh, what's that cloning? You might say, like, why is he cloning that? But that just sort of led to the witch hunt that happened after this. That led to people doing a deep dive into his images. So a little background, Steve McCurry is probably one of the most recognized names in photography. If you are an amateur photographer, pro photographer, you know his name. He's the guy who took that famous picture of the Afghan girl, the cover of National Geographic, basically the cover of National Geographic as a brand. He has been <clears throat> their poster boy as a photographer. As a photographer, he's still working to this day as a photographer. Um, he's been around forever. His work is commercially successful. His work is journalistically successful, or was until the scandal came out. And again, one of the biggest names for one of the most well-respected and most well-known magazines ever, National Geographic. So what's the big deal? Oh, we just made a little error here with the image here and cloning something. No, that led to a deeper investigation. Again, this was a long time ago, and here's where we start to get the trouble. Here's where we start to have a problem. And this is actually funny to me, not funny actually, it's sad to me that when this issue came out, it became very polarizing. People that brought it up and scolded him for it were attacked. And actually, that's probably what took me six years to talk about this topic because I was afraid of the industry, afraid of National Geographic, like not wanting to hire me. They're the big name, you know? Afraid of other magazines not wanting to hire me. It's funny, right? You, you, you think that you want to work for journalistic magazines telling the truth and you're afraid to tell the truth. It's kind of sad, um, but that's the case. A lot of photographers were afraid to talk about it openly. If you even look in this interview, a couple big name photographers, Pulitzer Prize winner, talked about it and that person came out and had a bold statement, but another photographer was kind of like brushed it under the rug and that's exactly what happened. The scandal was brushed under the rug. So what is the scandal exactly? Well, here you go. Here's where you start to see the problem here. You see, this is the image that was published. This is the image that's in its archive. This is the image that he's probably selling as a, oh, as a print. And what happened? This kid's missing. So we clone this little boy out here. He doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and then it gets worse. Well, look at this. We've cloned out this gentleman here, this gentleman here, even in the background. Sorry, lady, you're done. It became a red blob there, so she looks like she's part of what they're selling in the store, but that is a... Girl they're watching, you have another guy here. Not only was this one cloned, the outfit color was changed. So that's interesting. That's a pretty deep level there. So the, the little tarp over that was removed. You had this cellar here. I don't even think you should have removed that, but fine. I mean, you shouldn't have removed anything ethically. And it just kind of goes on and on and on. There's a lot of examples. And look at the comments section, 315 comments, and it goes nuts. Wow. So uh, it's a deep dive in there if you want to read the comments section. But this article was out in... Peter Pixel is a follow-up scandal as well. So there's a lot to unpack here. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong as a photographer removing things? It's not wrong if you're just a normal photographer, not normal, but if you're a conceptual photographer, if you're just an uh, amateur photographer, uh, if you're not working for a journalistic publication, if you don't sell yourself as a photojournalist or you don't consider yourself a journalist and you're not working in that context, there's a lot wrong with it. That's kind of the number one thing they teach you in school. That's the number one thing they teach you in ethics in photojournalism is not to do that. That's the big no-no. You know, I mean, there's a lot of other things you're not supposed to do, but that's kind of like number one. You know when there's like the, the survey says, for those of you from that generation, they say, things you're not supposed to do. And the guy asks, I, I can't think of the show right now. It's not Price is Right. It's the other one. It's <laughs> Family Feud. Family Feud. So survey says things you're not supposed to do as a photojournalist, clone stuff and remove it. Boom. Number one. Easily. Guarantee. Ask the audience. And that's exactly what he did. And then what happened later on when this came out, again, this was a long time ago. Again, why am I revisiting it now? This is not a personal attack. This is just something I want to put out there because I think it's important. I am teaching now a lot of one-on-one -on -one classes. I am teaching young photographers that want to become professional photojournalists, documentary photographers, or even amateurs that want to do real projects about real people and real stories and they want to be storytellers. So it's important for people to know this. It's important to understand this is wrong and here is why, you know? And so when he came out there and did this, he is working for National Geographic for a lot of these different assignments. He's doing shoots for National Geogra Geographic, stories for National Geographic. His pictures are being shown in National Geographic. And here he is removing things. Here's something that they would, should be telling their photographers first day. You know, all my assignments for the New York Times, if I ever clone something out or put something in, you know, I'm not a big enough name. They would have, like, published a, a retraction about my pictures, and they would have stopped working with me, 100%. You can see it all the time in other, other, other photographers, it happens. But with him, when this happened, no comment from National Geographic. No 
investigating back through his archive. Easy to find, easy to look, easy to call out. I mean, they're journalists. It's a journalistic ma- journalism magazine. They have journalists right there that could dig into his archive, look at his raw files, and figure out what pictures were taken for their magazine and what was botched or what was <laughs> photoshopped. And I haven't seen anything about that. I haven't seen a statement. So why is it wrong? Because there's a trust level. As a photojournalist, you're supposed to be telling the truth. There's a lot of biases out there. Sure, there's a lot of things you could say. Well, you could leave this out of a photo. You could not take this photograph. Sure, but as a journalist, we're supposed to be as fair as possible. Even as photographers to both sides, we're supposed to tell the truth. We're supposed to just be a witness in capturing history or capturing what's happening, even on travel stories. Every time I did a story for the New York Times, a travel story, you might think, well, it's light. What's the harm in this? Again, it's trust. You lose that trust, and then you lose the whole trust in the publication, and people lose trust in us as journalists. And, you know, nowadays it's so easy to erase things. It's so easy to fix things, fix things in Photoshop. It's so much more accessible to people. It happens so much more that we've lost so much trust, you know? So this was a chance. This was a real chance for them to say, for him to come out and say it was wrong, for Dasher Geographic to come out and say it was wrong. We don't condone this sort of behavior. This is not what we're about. This isn't what you can expect in, the, in our history. This isn't what you can expect moving forward. A lot of the editors that worked with him probably aren't there to this day. Probably none of them are there to this day, but they had a chance to come out and mention this. And they're not responsible, the old, the new editors, but I feel like they do have a responsibility to come out and say this is wrong. There's a future generation of photographers out there that's going to go do stories like that, like this, and if they think he can get away with it, you know, I'll equate this to cycling because I'm interested in the sport of cycling, right? You know, dopers, all of a sudden someone dopes, they win the race, he wins the contest, he wins the Nat Geo cover, other people start to do it as well. They feel like they have to keep up, they feel like they have to fake things. So not only was he photoshopping images, he was also setting up his shots extensively as well. And like really deep, I've worked with some of his fixers who have told me these things. I'm not gonna bring up their names because I don't wanna get them involved in this, but I've worked with fixers in different countries that even thought I would want them to do that because when they worked with Steve McCurry, he did that. Bring costumes and people, fixers have come out and other people have come out that he's paid to do these things. Paying people, also a no-no. You know, paying people to do these shots, things like that, and also, you know, bringing costumes, you would bring luggage, like his famous railway shot, like bringing that luggage to the scene, it was like the fixer's sister, and pretending, like all these shots were created, they're all, all fine in the commercial world, by the way, so don't get me wrong, all fine in the commercial world, but not when you're shooting for a journalistic publication, not when you're shooting for National Geographic, who prides themselves on journalism, and not to take away from their other journalists and the work that, other work that they've done as well, which is amazing, but to me this does, it, <laughs> It stains them, you know, even though the other people didn't do it, you, you plant that seed of doubt, you know, and that's the problem. That's the thing is people have a hard enough time trusting us. And then again, what are you saying to future generations out there? And a lot of photographers are scared. You know, it's really sad. Like I mentioned before, a lot of photographers are scared to talk about this. I was. Six years later, here I am because I'm somewhat out of the industry. You know, I do my own personal projects and I pitch them to magazines and that's fine, but I, I'm not beholden to the industry anymore. I make my money off of other things, my commercial photography, my classes and things like that. So I don't... I don't mind to talk about him, but some people say like, oh, well, oh, you're just jealous. I'm not, you know, I, I don't enter these contests that he's entering, I don't, I don't care. You know, if I get published, my story goes in National Geographic, great, if it doesn't, that's also great. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty easygoing person, I'm not bitter. He's more recognized than I ever will be, he'll make more money off his photography than I ever will be. I'm okay with that, I'm fine with that. I'm not okay with salting our industry, not okay with staying in our industry, not okay with teaching a future generation of young storytellers or new storytellers that this is okay. And, you know, as, as, as media, you know, we lose our budget for the media and as people don't trust things and people have a short attention span, it's hard enough, you know, so you're not helping us out, you're not doing us any favors. And again, I understand why other photographers are afraid to talk about this. I mean, look at the comments section. If you go and do a deep dive in here, people are afraid to just, because they want to work for National Geographic. It's really sad that people are afraid as journalists to tell the truth because they're afraid that magazines that are supposed to be telling the truth are going to excommunicate them, but it happens, you know, people, are, or even just the comments from people out there that don't understand our industry and don't understand why it's wrong. Uh, but yeah, so wrong on a lot of different levels. You know, now that I've got the live stream up, I, wow, a lot of questions out there, woohoo. So this is different. So before when I did the live stream, I wasn't live and I had no questions. But now when I'm live, I have people on there saying hello. Also guys, just uh, mention a little bit of a hello, where you're coming from, what you're up to. Um, I, it makes me feel good to know people out there from different countries checking things out. Uh, again, check out the full episode about this. And if you guys are interested, and knowing or deeper questions about this, you can, you can ask me and I'll get to them later on if you're not watching this live or if you're interested in some of the other, if you're interested in just seeing what I, you know, the, the, 
how this all started. Check out, check out some of these articles. I'll put a link to those in the description box and check in. Uh, I, I can't talk right now. Check out the, <laughs> check out the full um, episode that I did last night that I just released. That's like one of my most viewed episodes. Oh, that's why you did it. You get the most views. I don't care. Honestly, like it's great to have more views. Great to have more people. It's not why I did it. Honestly, 100%. For those of you out there going to say negative comments, it's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I want people to understand that's wrong. And I'm doing it finally now, six years later, because... I'm comfortable. I'm not afraid of the industry. Again, it's a, there's a lot of terrible things in, in the journalism industry. There's a lot of wonderful things, too. And they you know, provided me with this life that I have today, so I appreciate that. And I, and I separate a lot of that. Every time I did 100 times for the New York Times, we didn't tolerate this kind of stuff. We couldn't take gifts. We couldn't take anything. And, and even the most innocent stories, you know, a travel story about Hoi An, like we couldn't take gifts. I couldn't be put, having people put costumes on. I couldn't Photoshop my images, all that, because of the integrity of the mag magazine or the integrity of the newspaper in that situation means more than anything else. You know, you lose that, you kind of lose everything, you lose the trust, and you lose the trust in journalism, then, then what is it? You know, what is it anymore? So I wasn't even as surprised. I was disappointed and mad about the scandal, but I was more surprised and more disappointed in the cover-up or, or the lack of addressing it. You know, what happened was, the first thing, I'll give you a little background here. I don't know why I've got my metrics here. Sorry, you can see what I'm doing. What happened was, he initially said, let me put myself big here so you can see my big, ugly face here. All right, guys, I'm new to the live stream thing. I'm going to be making some technical errors. Let me know how that audio sounds again. Let me, let me pull this up, make sure there's not any errors there, and then I'll talk about what happened. Someone wrote, oh. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot of people didn't know that because it was covered up, you know? Oh, man, and, and Bugsy Bunny, I, I know you always put that, and I know your real name, but, it's, uh, but you made a really nice comment. Uh, my wife and I were reading it, and we really enjoyed your comment uh, about what you had to say about this. So I really do appreciate you guys taking the time. And, you know, another thing for, for Hi from Washington. Hi, Chris. Hi from Milwaukee. Wow, Milwaukee. Awesome. So, John, good. To, I love that you guys. You guys, don't be afraid to ask me questions here. Greetings from Australia. Uh, from New York, Linda, always my best commenter here. I feel like I need to start like paying Linda a subscription for commenting so much. She's wonderful. Helps, my, helps me out a lot. You guys, let me know if you're joining here um, for the first time. If you're meeting me here for the first time, let me know. Not let me know. Subscribe. That's what I'm trying to say. Subscribe and check out my online store. So, <coughs> sorry, I'm coughing. In. Man, I got I to learn some of this etiquette here. So again, guys, like I mentioned before, I will start that subscription where I will have live streams that are exclusive for the people that are subscribing. That will be coming out soon. Not here to sell you a ton of stuff here. Just wanted to mention that quick. But don't forget, if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to comment. It does help out the channel. And these live streams, it really does help if you have questions because I'm decent at thinking on my feet. I'm pretty good at that. Uh, I'm horrible when I have a script, which I don't have a script. I just wanted to talk about this today again because I thought it was important. So what happened afterwards? Surely when he got caught, when this happened, again, I'm showing the wrong screen here. No, I'm not. I think I have the right screen here. Um, surely when this happened, I think, I think the screen, okay, surely when this happened, there would be, you know, Nat Geo would come out and, and say, no, this is horrible, let's go back and revisit his archive, and surely he'd come out and say, I'm so sorry, I apologize, and all that, and he'd go through that sort of forgiveness uh, of cycle, but that's not what happened. First, he actually came out and said that he didn't know that his printers were doing this, that his retouchers, that his studio was doing this. That's absolute BS. People are not doing that, especially a guy like him, especially at that level, especially with his notoriety, and then working for these publications, there's a lot of people that knew, and our industry knew as well. I heard a lot of rumblings about this stuff as I became a professional photojournalist working around Southeast Asia, some of the same stomping grounds that he was working in, you know, he was shooting in Vietnam, shooting in India and places like that, hearing a lot of these things from fixers, you know, I had a fixer that worked with him, I won't mention the country because I don't want to out him, but he told me that Stephen McCurry actually threw his memory cards at him, he made some little mistakes and he, he whipped them at him, so I'm not going to say that, you know, he's wonderful in that regard, sure as photographers we, you know, we're in stressful situations, but I've never felt the need to throw anything or never thrown anything at anybody that I've worked with or even that I haven't worked with. I don't, I'm not throwing things at people. Sure, I'm mad at my neighbors for their dog urinating in front of my door, but even that, I haven't thrown their urine at them or I haven't thrown my own urine at them yet. And I don't think I will. But you never know, it is kind of getting annoying. But they, he never came out and, and basically he blamed it on that. It was like the Lance Armstrong cover-up. Again, I'm gonna equate it to cycling. It was like, well, oh, first he denied, denied, denied. Then when that came out, you know, I think he just, he, he, yeah, he said that. He said he didn't know and his studio didn't know. Bull, bull crap, I mean, bullshit, I guess I can say that. I don't know if I have to like change my rating here because I said shit, but bullshit. You know, I mean, for someone that's scaring his staff like that, scaring even a fixer that, he'd never, that he's only working with for a couple days, bullshit that his 
people are taking liberties at his studio to Photoshop out bullshit that people are doing something this big here and removing that many people and he just didn't know. You know, you're taking it and... Sorry, I've got all my different setups here. I mean, bullshit that you didn't know that someone from your studio has removed a full person. Bullshit, you didn't... Oh, no, I, you know your photos, you stare at your photos, you were there when you took the photos, you know them deeply, I don't care how big of a name you are, you know if someone's removing another... Uh, let's see, another bike back here, another human here, another human here. That doesn't, you don't just, oh, oh, I didn't even recognize that. At my exhibition, standing in front of my giant photograph or, you know, approving these photographs, bull, bullshit, you didn't know. And then later on, when it became evident that he did this multiple times and it wasn't just a one-off thing, then yeah, okay, you think, his, you think his retoucher in different studios or different times was just repetitively doing this, just randomly? No, it doesn't happen. This is something the photographer would tell the retoucher. They would give them notes. These are like commercial retouching things. I do commercial photography. We give our retoucher notes, even on a commercial level, where there's no ethical standard there for stuff like that. You know, we're, we're having, you know, adding in uh, skies or making the skies look different, removing outlets and things like that. Our retouchers are not doing anything unless we tell them to do that. So at this level, in a journalism capacity, bullshit to, to say that you didn't know. Just, just bull, you know? And then setting things up and things like that, hearing that from other people. Again, other photographers are afraid. Other photographers are scared of Nat Geo. Other photographers are scared of Steve McCree. Such a big name. Uh, and then Nat Geo never really came out and made a statement about it. That, that bugs me. You know, they should have come out. They should have said, again, investigated his archive, investigated images that have been published with him, done a deep dive into that like they do on their other stories and talked about it and gone deep into it and say, here's what he did. Here's what I was wrong. Let's remove these images from our archive. They're stained, you know, and let's make a statement about that this is wrong. Let's teach a future generations out there that this is wrong, that we don't allow this, we don't tolerate this, set an example, make an example out of him, but no, you know, he just basically, they didn't say much about it or anything at all, and he just basically changed his bio. He's still a Magnum photographer. Now, you can argue Magnum has a lot of photojournalists on there, a lot of documentary photographers. They have fine art photographers as well, but, you know, they didn't mention anything about it either, and that's a whole other episode, and that's a whole other topic. If you're interested in that kind of stuff and really deep ethics, a guy on Twitter, Duck Rabbit, does a lot with that kind of stuff and really kind of going after sort of Magnum and selling sort of these pictures that people should not be selling as prints. Anyway, that's a whole other topic, but check out, check out his account. It's really interesting, and really, if you're interested in the ethics of journalism and that kind of stuff, you can see what he's doing there. But, you know, these pictures are still being sold, and fine if you're selling them as fine art. Again, no problem. You're selling them as commercial work for an ad campaign, fine, no problem. But you're putting them in a magazine that's supposed to have a high standard for journalism ethics. Not, that's a problem. And then he basically, what happened was, in the end, he just changed his bio. That's it. And that's supposed to exonerate him. That's like Lance Armstrong getting caught and saying, no, no, I, I, I wasn't a professional cyclist. I was just riding next to the guys that were riding in the Tour de France. And I just happened to be faster than them. I'm like... Okay, maybe that's not a great analogy, but you see what I mean there, right? It's like, it's bull. Like, you, <laughs> you were representing yourself as a photojournalist because that sounded cool, right? It, people, it sounded like, oh, man, he's out doing these assignments. And he was. He was shooting for National Geographic. He was doing his, his assignments. His work was published in their magazine. So all of a sudden, to just rewrite your own history, so much wrong there, so much to unpack there. But, like, that's what he did. And then just rebranded himself and said, no, I'm a visual storyteller. I'm not a photojournalist, not a documentary photographer. And it was just like, oh, okay. And people came to his defense, and I get it. If you're not in the industry, if you're not a photojournalist, and you're, you know, you're, you're not worried about what this does to our reputation, then I get why you don't care. And I don't get why you're so upset at us for caring, but I get why you don't care. But if you do read these magazines, if you do have some faith left in journalism, and you do have some faith left in photojournalists and their ethics, then you should care. And, this, you know, and that's why I wanted to put this out there. Again, not Sarah Grapes. I don't care. I don't strive to be him. I definitely don't now, but I don't. I mean, take my own path. I'm lucky, privileged enough to take photographs for a living, get paid to do it, and I have lived a good life so far off of doing that. I'm happy about that. I don't care about these photography contests. I'm not beholden to the industry for a while. Again, afraid because of that industry it can be scary. You don't want to... You don't want people to be looking at you, right? You don't want to be the troublemaker. And again, that's why people don't talk about it. But I wanted to talk about it. And why six years later? Because I trust you guys. I trust my audience. And I have a new audience of people in my one-on-one -on -one classes and just people that are learning from me, photography through YouTube, and people that care about this stuff, young street photographers that want to do projects. But they want those projects maybe to be published later on in a magazine. Well, guess what? You start setting things up. You start faking things. You start paying for things. Changes everything. Changes the dynamic. You can't do that. You're not going to be published. Or if you did, you'll get in trouble. Or if you do it for Nat Geo, maybe you won't get in trouble. But, but you should. <laughs> wow, I'm being a little bit sassy today. So I'm going to open up the comments section here, guys, because I've got a lot of people sort of saying, a lot of people saying things, just making comments. See, you guys are afraid too. Don't be scared. I've got your comments here. All right, let's see. I'm going to scroll through. A lot of great, a lot of great um, 
I don't get people on here, but I'm looking for actual questions. Uh, let's see. I'm surprised to catch this live on a Sunday night. Well, thank you. I think I'll be doing these at this time often, Monday morning my time, which is like nighttime U.S. My audience is mainly the U.S., which is interesting. You know, uh, I think people, I would love for people in Vietnam to be checking this out because I think there's a lot of this kind of journalistic debate and things like that and setting things up. I've always seen this as a big problem in, in Vietnam for the, a lot of these photography contests. Um, just something just to bring up, like photography contest, and I see the genesis of this. I see why people do this, is you get so beholden to photography contests and you want to win them because you think that's going to make a big name for yourself, so that forces you into these. It happens with amateurs and it definitely happens with pros, is you know, you, you want the shot to be perfect. You want the composition to be perfect. With him, I, again, I was always skeptical because once you're a professional photographer or even an amateur that goes out and shoots a lot, you know that life isn't so perfect. And you guys out there, it doesn't have to be perfect, your shots. I mean, sure, you want clean compositions, but it's okay for things not to be perfect. It's okay to have, like, you know, let's see. It's okay. This guy's okay, you know? He doesn't need to be removed, this kid. I'm scrolling up here. Let's see. Sorry. You know, he's okay. It's all right. Let him, let him live in the digital world. You didn't need to erase him from history. It's okay not to be perfect, but I see what happens because, I, again, I was deep into that industry. I saw the industry. I saw what it takes. I saw people thinking they need to win these contests to, to, to make it to the top, to get these assignments, to be a Nat Geo photographer, and we're, we're, we're teaching the wrong lessons here. I think we're going backwards in a, in a world where, where we're already hurting here as, as journalists. Um, oh, so great question from Linda out of New York and oh, Simon Pollock, think tank, fellow think tank person. Well, he really works for them. I'm just... Uh, lowly ambassador, but good, good morning, Simon, um, from Australia. Linda's question is, for example, are contrast and adjusting exposures allowed in post-production? What is the limit for basic processing? That's a great question, because as you can see here, he's also doing a ton of post-processing on the images as well. Linda, your question is a whole other topic to unpack here. It really does depend on the magazine you're working for, the New York Times, and uh, is very limiting on how much you can do in post-production. I would say this amount of color toning would be okay for them a tiny bit of just adjustment and contrast. The old rule of thumb when I was in school was many years ago is like if you spend a mil more than a minute on a photograph, then you did something wrong. But that has changed because you can remove things so quickly, you can do things in more than a minute now. So that, that old saying is not true anymore. Yes, basic color toning, basic adjustments. You don't want to be changing anyone's skin tones. You obviously don't want to be cloning and removing things. A little bit of contrast is okay. Um, that kind of stuff. But yeah, there's a fine line. And every magazine, every publication is quite different. And even certain photographers are held to different standards, which is kind of what I was hinting at in that last episode, is the hypocrisy in photography. Like some photographers are allowed to go in and dodge and burn and do crazy things. I mean, look at some of the past World Press winners. Look at some of those scandals. Like just pull up like World Press scandal, toning, things like that. They're allowed to do selective toning. Maybe not cloning and removing. That's what gets really great. But they're allowed to do it. And other photographers that aren't as big as names aren't allowed to do that. I've had that experience even with the New York Times. You know, I do basic color correction, just minimal things, quickly editing. I will do a separate video where I show you how I edit my editorial pictures. Uh, I'm not good at doing fancy things, McCurry-like things. I'm, kind of, I'm making McCurry a verb. That's what I want to get out of this day. I want you guys to be like, oh, just McCurry it. I mean, I don't want you to actually do that, but I want to make it a verb because I want people to know that it's wrong. But don't make it a joke like it's right. Make it a joke like it's wrong. So anyway, sorry, I got off my little tangent. So basic color correction, fine. You know, cropping a little bit, fine. Um, you don't want to be like, <sighs> yeah, it's a tough debate there. But um, again, it depends on the publication you're working for. I would say... Uh, news agencies like Reuters, AFP, AP, you know, if they had this scandal, they would come out, they wouldn't work with that photographer again. They have a history of doing that. There's photographers that have gotten caught doing these things. There's this scandal here. Let me pull this one up here. Um, I think it was in the bottom of this one article here. So, uh, one second, you guys, let me pull this up. So this scandal here, you know, of, of the photographer taking a composite of these two images and then this photographer is not going to work anymore for these publications. Associated Press, Reuters, New York Times are going to be a lot more strict about that. And in Nat Geo's defense, the new editors probably are more strict about this. And that was a lapse in a few decades with him. But again, I still feel like the new editors as a magazine, as an editor, well, I'm not blaming the photo editors to this, who they're now. See that? I'm still afraid. So I'm like, I'm not blaming you guys now. So, you know, if you wanted to publish my story about Gibbons or something, I mean, fun, you know, I'm not, I'm, but I'm not actually blaming them. <laughs> I'm blaming the people in the past. I'm blaming them as a publication to not still go through this and not still address this because 
this is like self-investigation. This is something they should be doing, something they should be doing a deep dive. So Linda, answer your question, a long way to answer your question. Basic color toning, I would say, is fine. Contrast, things like that, a little bit. Don't go overboard with it. New York Times would be really strict. Wire service is even more strict. Some wire services require that you send the raw files, and that's it. I think more magazines and more newspapers, if they had the manpower, but they should find the manpower, but budgets are tough, they should be doing that. You should be sending the raw file in, but then you can make the debate of like, well, you can do things in camera. You could adjust the contrast. So that's hard. I think if you're not changing the basic essence of the scene, obviously, like, and, but again, not removing things, not taking things out, but if you, the color palette, if you're making all of a sudden it look like it was a dark and stormy day and it wasn't, not cool. You know, if you're just adding a tiny bit of a contrast because you had your profile set to flat, more cool. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> so someone asked me about how about live Zoom calls for members who subscribe. You know, I... I that's a good one. I think I'll be doing live streaming. I do my one-on-one -on -one classes, which are more direct people that, because they're more customized for people that really want to talk about direct things about them. So those are more one-on-one -on -one classes that I offer through my, through my um, website here. Let me go back to this one camera set up here. And I know I'll do a better job of looking at you guys here. Let me get in close. You can see all my imperfections. A lot of blemishes on there. 44 is showing. A lot of sun. Sun is showing. Where's sunscreen out there? Take away one thing from today. One thing should be don't clone. If you're a photojournalist, don't think, think, take things out of your images or add things. Number two is wear sunscreen. All right, any other questions here? Let's take a look. Video reprocess would be cool for post. I am gonna do that. It's gonna be really short. It's gonna be actually kind of surprisingly short when I do a video about, um, about my, my, <laughs> my, my retouching process because it's just very, very simple. But I'll do a little bit of the editing software that I use, and I use Lightroom to edit, but I use to call my images and sort of tag them. I use another thing called Photo Mechanic. So I'm going to read these questions to myself first because I'm afraid I'm going to read something live, and one of my stupid friends will say something and make me read something out loud or some prankster will. But again, you know what, you guys? I, I'm very happy. Like, I read all the comments in my... The, when I first started this channel, let me just give you guys some praise. When I first started this channel, you know, I did reviews about like I had so many polarizing comments, it almost like... That scared me off, but annoyed me off of doing this channel anymore because people are so negative. But as I grew and got to know my audience, and got to know you guys, and the right people found me, and the right people subscribed, and we built this little community, I just have a lot of love for you guys because like, even the comments on this, I was afraid I'd wake up to a million comments. I know if this gets picked up or goes bigger somewhere else, I will get those comments, but the, the part that I'm just happy with is that like, I trusted you guys to do this story, and that says a lot about you guys. Your comments are always well thought out. You guys are smart people. We have the same sort of uh, moral compass, I think, a lot of us. And even, the, even those, those of you out there that aren't, that don't care about professional photojournalism or you don't want to be a professional photojournalist, you respect it and you respect sort of documentary, you respect the ethics of it and you respect the debate. And even if you do have an, uh, an alternate opinion than me, you do it in a very, you know, a very fair way. So I, I just appreciate that. Because again, I wouldn't do this if I didn't feel comfortable with you guys. And I, again, I, I'd be lying if I wasn't a little bit nervous about putting this out there and, and it being picked up. But even in the beginning, I was, thought I'd wake up to a lot of negative comments. But I just woke up to a lot of well thought out, smart comments, and it just made me happy. So, okay, let's see. I've got a question here. I'm going to read it to myself for. Uh, okay, this question is great. It says, Justin, it seems as though McCurry is held in such reverence that he can't be criticized. Have you ever experienced that? People rushing to his defense, but if you or I did that, you'd be shunned. Yeah, that's kind of my point, you know, and that's kind of my point about the hypocrisy here. Um, I think if it was anyone else, they would be. If I did this, done, you know, like, out of here. You're done. New York Times would never work them again. Different magazine, I mean, different publication, but I would expect even Nat Geo, if I did this now, they would not be happy with it. I suspect a lot of photographers out there are still doing this. In fact, I've seen photographers still doing things like this. Now, as far as the, or maybe not the Photoshop stuff, because that's really hard to tell, but yeah, a lot of other things that I've seen. Maybe one day I'll be okay with talking about those. You know, I mean, I see a lot of unethical things. I see people ripping off my pictures. I see bigger named photographers ripping off my pictures and claiming it as their own, doing the same exact composition on something that's like kind of not a composition or like they would have had to set it up to get that shot because I waited for that like a week to get it naturally. So that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's out there. I think big names get a pass on a lot of things. I get big magazines get a pass on a lot of things. I think big magazines and big publications and big contests give a pass to photographers who have those big names. You know, they just do. I mean, look at some of the toning that people ridicule and some of the big magnet photographers, if they tone that way, they can get away with it for these contests. You know, they can tone however they want, they can do whatever they want. Not all of them, not every contest, but it does happen. It's obviously out there and you're teaching people the wrong thing. You're teaching young photographers the wrong message and it's just, you know, 
that's a whole other debate. Like, I don't mind a little bit of like, you know, if you're adding contrast and things like that, but I'm just saying what it's, it's not fair if you're going to say we don't allow this, but we allow it for this photographer, but not for this photographer. If you're a magnet photographer, fine, we'll look the other way. I mean, even look at, look at this a series a long time ago where the New York Times is something with an agency called Noor, and they had a lot of like photographers do this. Like, it was like a lead up, even something entertainment, but it was in the New York Times, but they did like a lead up to all the Oscars many, many years ago, but a lead up to the, to the Oscars. So they followed like Sean Penn around. I can't remember the other actors and actresses and bad at that stuff, but they like followed them around for the day and posted pictures. But the retouching was so heavy. And these were journalists. The retouching was so heavy, but I respect the New York Times for doing it. They listed the retouching agency on there because that's how heavily retouched it was. So they didn't present it as journalism so much. They presented it as entertainment. So that was a little bit different. But the fact that they mentioned that showed you how deep they were going with the toning and how they th were uncomfortable with it. But I have seen that. I think if you're a new photographer, you're not a big name photographer in contest and for these publications, they will not look the other way. I think if you're more established, and he is too big. He's like a different level of big. I mean, his pictures sell for tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, and they're global, and they're famous, and they're, they're iconic, I should say. And yeah, kind of too big to fail sort of thing. So it's a great question, and I, and I agree. I mean, I think that's, that's what it is. You know, I think they're too big to, to bring it up. I think they made the wrong decision. I don't think it's too late to sort of address it and get deep about it. Maybe this will spark it. Maybe enough of us talk about it. Maybe this will spark them to do a little research or, or come out and make a statement and say how wrong it is. And, you know, for him, I think that has passed. You know, I think he just rebranded himself. And, you know, I think he's the kind of person, I don't know him personally, so I shouldn't say a personal attack, but I think, you know, first denying it and blaming it on your retoucher is BS. And then to come out and say, again, very Lance Armstrong, like, you know, and then finally you get caught. And then, but even like Lance, when he got caught, I think he acted a little bit like he was sorry, but he was like really caught. He didn't really act like he was sorry and just kind of rebranded himself. So, yeah, let's look at some of the other questions here. Um, let's see, any other questions here? Comments, though, I do appreciate that. Guys, don't be shy to ask because I am looking live here at your questions, so I will answer them. I am having my morning coffee here in Vietnam. It is now, I don't even have a clock up here. It's now 8.17. For those of you that are tuning in, I thought that it would also be fun if you could... Uh, I've been trying to do some little like quick tips on my, my Instagram account, quick tips on YouTube shorts and things like that. Just trying to give you guys some ideas, some creative tips and things like that. So this right behind me is just something called a gobo. If you haven't heard of them, they're or short for a go-between. These little things, you, you can uh, they're almost like little filters you put in between your light source and your subject. So you can slide them in. Some of them are like these big boards. Some of them are these little small things that I use here on one of my Colber lights, this new light that I'm testing out here. But you slide them in, they create these patterns. This isn't the sun coming in my house in the morning. The sun doesn't come into the second half of the day. So I'm lying to you guys. But I'm being transparent. I'm not lying to you guys. That's, I'm telling you that that's the fake sun. But I'm not also, this isn't a live broadcast for the New York Times about how the sun comes into my house. So you see the difference there? For those of you that are still on the fence. So this is a light. These are gobos. You can check out. I did a little YouTube short about that. You can check that out or on my Instagram where you can see how they work. They're a great and fun way for you guys out there that use lighting, that want to be creative with your studio photography, portraits, or even food photography. You can have these different little uh, patterns in there. Again, they're kind of cheap and fun to use and really easy to use. Um, yeah, and, and someone mentioned too, uh, I don't like when I get these like, yeah, let's see. Yeah, people might say, like someone mentioned, like, oh, it comes off the sour grapes. It sure does. You know, I think when I mentioned, uh, when I talked about this a little bit, you know, in smaller groups, like some people, it does come off the sour grapes. And even people that aren't journalists would say, like, it's funny the way the industry works, right? So when I mentioned this, all other photographers behind the scenes were all like, oh, my God, this is such BS. Like, what the heck? Blah, blah, blah. And then in public, people are like, yeah, mm, uh, no comment, no comment. And we're journalists, you know? We're supposed to be the ones that are okay with calling things out. So it just shows you, like, how afraid we are and how wrong that is. I like to call my dog at some point in this episode. One of my dogs won't come up here if she's not really in the mood, but my other dog with just a little bit of a howl, I can introduce him to my dog, Chew. Choo Choo. It's probably bad if I'm calling my dog in for comments, you know, during the live stream. It means I'm not getting good questions. But you guys are getting good questions. I'm just teasing you. Um, but yes, to, and for me personally, not, not sour grapes. It's not, I'm not in this industry anymore. Again, I do have my work published in Washington Post. I do still do New York Times assignments and things like that, but um, I'm not afraid of them. I trust that they're that they trust me and, and the fact that I talk about this should only help my, my reputation, not, not, not make it bad because like they care about stuff like this. And I, and Nat Geo current editors, I know a few of them and I, and I, I believe that they do as well. So it, again, it's not a knock on the existing staff. It's just as an institution, I still feel like this is something they need to bring up and maybe, you know, they bring it up and they're a little bit afraid, but he's so iconic. I think they're afraid. 
Uh, let me scroll down a little bit there. I want to keep these, com I know some of you have some general questions here, um, but I, I want to keep the questions related to this topic. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about the, some of the other things in my video, but most of your comments were about the Steve McCurry thing. I talked about five things in my video. Again, watch that video. I just released it last night. So it's things that sort of epic rant, I called it, as things that irk me about the photography industry and the Steve McCurry, the hypocrisy part was obviously the big one. That's the one we're talking about today. So I spent 99% of the time talking about, uh, but the rest of it was, um, you know, I did talk about photo contest and you guys out there that are interested in entering photo contest, you know, just a quick little topic on that, a quick little touch on that is there's nothing wrong with photography contests, I'm not saying don't enter them, but check, well, there's a lot wrong with them, but just there's nothing wrong with entering some of them. But what I would say, the short version is, is enter photography contests that are going to push you, they're going to challenge you, they're going to get you to get out there and shoot on a specific theme. Be wary of the ones that are money grabs, that are rights grabs. A lot of these competitions, they'll own your pictures forever. They use them as much as they want. You don't get anything out of it. Again, I told you guys, I want a contest. That I don't want to call it out wrong. I keep forgetting the name of the publication, but I think it was a. Uh, I don't want to say it because it's not fair. If I, you know, if if I say the wrong one, I'll do. I'll go back and research this. But I entered a photography competition a couple of years ago, and I don't enter these much. But I, I won. I won like the category I was in, and didn't even win my like money back for the entry fee, which is like thirty bucks or something like that. And then later on, they published a book, and they want money out of you. That was their scam. Like we're going to publish the book, and we want to use your images. Not only do you not get paid for it, we want you to pay for the image. And I was like, BS. I'm not paying for you to publish my image. Like forget it. This is ridiculous. This is like your stupid money rights like grab thing, money and rights grab thing. And they were like, oh no no, it's okay. We'll publish it. I'm like, really? Like. But a lot of contests out there, they're money grabs. They don't mean anything. Like, yes, sir, I'm not taking anything away from a Pulitzer or a World Press Award. Like, but even those, like, honestly, like, if you didn't win, don't, it's okay. You know, it doesn't make you a bad photographer. It doesn't make you, it doesn't mean that you're worse than the photographer that won. They did a great story. But every year, they're looking for different stories. Judges looking for different things, different topics out there on a small level or more amateur scale for photography awards. A lot of people just repeating pictures or copycat pictures. A lot of editors, a lot of, a lot of, the judges can be lazy. I've been in those competitions. I've always judged with everything I had because I, like, I have integrity, but I've been with judges in these huge competitions that are lazy about it. They're not getting paid or they're not getting paid well and they put a lot of time in and they just kind of reward simple. They're not doing research. They're not saying, oh, this shot was set up or this shot won last year. Or, this is fake, whatever. They're not. So don't put a lot of stock into that. Enter competitions that are going to give you your rights. They're going to pay you if you did win. Um, and reward you if they're going to use your work. But more importantly, just enter competitions that are going to push you to go out there and shoot, to get you outside of your comfort zone, to have a little bit of fun with your photography, things like that. I will be offering a free monthly competition again, 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 what am I saying? Again, with my, <laughs> it's a weird transition, again, with that membership that I'm going to have, I'm going to have a monthly competition for my members out there where I'm going to get deep into it. We're going to have prizes, uh, and the, it's not going to cost you anything. Guess what? Well, I guess it'll cost you your subscription. But, but, <laughs> but I will be putting a lot of time into these and I'll be putting a lot of thought into these and I won't take a money rights, I won't do a rights grab, I won't make money off of it besides my monthly description, but you'll be getting that for my time, really, for putting all my time in, all my effort in here. And you'll be getting weekly live streams and the competitions will be based on you guys going out there and challenging yourself, you pushing yourself, getting you outside of your comfort zone, giving you guys monthly assignments so that you practice your craft, so that you improve your photography, not entering past images. I want you to go out there and shoot. That will be the goal of this. Okay, let's bring up the questions here. You guys are all talking to each other, man. I see a lot of you guys, I thought you guys would be talking to me. You know, I like that you get to know each other, but I want some questions. Are there any contests that you think might be valuable or worth entering? You know, I, I'm out of the game a little bit with the contests. Again, I'll, I'll be doing my, my monthly contest again, and I think things like that. I think, you know, I will say, like, I, I look a little bit deeper into the rights there, but I like what LFI does, the like a uh, ma sort of online digital magazine, and they have a print magazine. I think, you know, they, they have some, it's a fun little community on there. I think entering little contests within your Facebook community is, again, stuff that you don't have to pay for. Enter competitions that you don't have to pay for it so you can look at other work, be inspired by other work, and have themes that are going to challenge you. So off the top of my head, again, it's not fair because I haven't done enough research to know the rights on there, but you can do your own research. You guys can be your own journalists. Check out some of the Leica competitions, the LFI competitions online. Uh, LFI, I'll put a link to that again in the description box. I'll try to remember all these things. I'm making little notes. Yeah, so how do the gobos look? It looks kind of natural, right? Actually, my windows are exactly that. I, I don't feel like turn. I have my like setup on a like 
sort of a janky uh, tripod here, so I don't want to move it or else I'd show you the outside of my office. But for those of you interested in my office, I'm going to do like a deep dive into my full office setup here and kind of the tools that I use. Again, I'll do some separate things about my toning and things like that. I've got a two camera system. But for those of you interested in like what a photographer's office is, I'm always moving things around. I have a lot of people give me crap about that lately. Like enough already, we get it. You change your office around every time you move it, you do a video. But I like it. I like designing. I like interior design. Re redid my kitchen. I didn't do anything, but I just picked stuff out with my wife and we had someone else do it. But this, I like moving furniture around. That's what I do when I come home from like a month on the road. I didn't realize that before I asked my question, I'll check out the review. <laughs> Um, let's see, before I go, guys, let's see, this is somewhat a, a broader question. Let me see, I've got another question. Uh, this is a great question. This is a topic that I, I am going to do a separate video about, but Linda's question from New York is somewhat broader of a qu question on the subject, maybe in the earlier beginning, or, ask, or as a student learning, how are you able to look at other professional designers' work and not copy it? personal style? That is a fantastic question and that is something I'm going to do a whole separate deep dive video about is finding your personal style, shedding that. I am working with, I won't say his name out of privacy, but I'm working with a photographer right now, a gentleman who runs a, a school. He just, he's an amateur, but he's, a, he's a, an amateur photographer. He has a Leica and he likes to do personal projects and you know, it's, it's very interesting. I see this a lot in my one-on-one -on -one class with people is they have they learned, they fell in love with photography from doing, but they fell in love with looking at another photographer's work, and then they really do become that photographer. I fell in love with James Noctoy's work early on in my career as a photographer, and it was really hard to sort of shed that, because I like some of his images, and I like what he does, and I was drawn to that. And once you learn how to do it, it's very tempting to copy it, right? Just like it's tempting for Steve McCurry to make his images perfect, or it's tempting for people to try to copy his images, his iconic images. What I think, I think it's much easier as an amateur to not do this. And this is something I want to talk about. And that's why I think the one-on-one -on -one style of learning is important because like now with this, this gentleman I'm teaching, like he, he has had these sort of cliche street photography images that he's been shooting for a long time and he's quite good at them, but that's not him. That's what he liked in the beginning, but we're shedding that. You know, it's sort of like we're rebuilding him. We had to chop him down, take two steps backwards. And that's really hard to do as an amateur and as a pro because you get rewarded for doing the other shots. Early on in my career, you rewarded for the way like shots or the best you could. I mean, that's giving myself too much credit, but trying to be like him, you're rewarded for it. And that's kind of the problem with the industry in these contests as well. You're rewarded for it. I think to have the confidence really takes some introspection there. You have to look deep inside you to say, you really have to want to be different. You really have to be okay with discovering who you are. And to do that, you're going to have to go through some bad times. But for you amateurs out there, or if you, you're independently, you have money to do this stuff, or you're just doing it for fun, it's much, I'm not going to say it's much easier, but it's much easier with your time, right? It's much because you can, you can kind of allow it. You don't have to earn that money right away. So that's what I really push amateurs to do that aren't like, they don't need to make that money. They don't need to please a client. It's to be okay with sucking for a bit, to figure out who you are and to be your own person. Take different, and the other thing you can do, Linda, is to take different influences from different people so you start to become your own version of that. I always look at, uh, I look at fashion photographers. I look at Richard Avedon's work. For those of you out there too that like photo books, I got a whole collection, but even books about photographers, read the biography about Richard Avedon called Something Personal. It's a fantastic book about his career by his former manager, controversial in some ways, but fantastic insight into his career as a photographer and his process and what that was like you know, uh, decades ago and he actually worked up into his 90s. Um, fascinating book. So. It's hard, you know, it's, it's really hard to have the confidence because you're going to get rewarded early on in contests by other editors and, and clients by taking others' pictures. I see people copy me all the time, but you know what? The reason we're on top of it for commercial work, the reason I got a lot of my editorial work is because I didn't do that. You know, I, I, I learned it, I understood it, I added little things to my repertoire, to my Rolodex of images, but then I, got, I, got, I went beyond that. You know, I started to say, what can I do? Let, let me think independently. Let's not inf look for influence to say like, oh, I'm gonna copy that when I go on a shoot. I have so many photographers that work for me do that. They say, oh, do you have a reference? I'm like, you know what, your reference is your mind. Use that, tap into that, tap into your history. Don't look at another photographer's work and just wanna copy it. Understand it, know why it's good or why it's not good, understand why they're getting work, understand the technique behind it. But especially for you guys out there that wanna do personal projects and wanna tell stories and wanna do documentary stuff, be yourself, you know? So this photographer, a great example, this is a great question. So this is like a whole other episode I go into. So you guys that came here for Steve McCurry, for me talking about personal work, I'll cut it short here. but. I will do a separate episode about this. I'll do a separate live stream about this maybe uh, because it's a fantastic topic and thank you for bringing it up. And I do actually have that on my little Notion list for, uh, for topics for YouTube. Those of you out there that use Notion, it's kind of a fantastic app. I know paid thing. I know a lot of people are getting paid to promote their app and that's why I saw it, but I really like it. Um, let's see.
Uh, let's see, any other questions? Yeah, it's a great comment. Someone said, one YouTuber I first followed because he was using the same brand of camera I had turned out to be more of more than one of those people who talked more about himself than that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I will, you know, last thing I did talk about is sort of the YouTube photographer on my, on my, that episode that I just did, the sort of episode that launched this sort of recap episode. And that's something I'm going to do a little bit more is I'll launch an episode on Sunday night. Maybe I'll launch it Sunday morning, Vietnam time, and do the live episode the same time here so I get the same people. So I'll do this every Monday morning, my time, Sunday night, your time, but give people a little bit more time to digest the, the episode. But a little recap episode might be fun to get deeper into the stuff. If you guys have enjoyed it, let me know because like I, I am very uh, beholden to like what you guys say. If you say you hate it and I get bad comments, I just crawl in the corner and I don't do these episodes. No, I, but it, it's nice. It helps me with confidence. You know, if you guys are into this and you ask questions and I know people care, I'll spend my time doing this, you know, on a Monday. So it is. Uh, oh, but I, before I run, I did want to talk about that. I did want to talk about the um, YouTube photographer versus the professional photographer thing. You know, people get in that debate, like, why do you knock those guys? I don't really knock those guys for what they do. I just knock it, like, for those of you out there that come to me or go online and they're looking for help with storytelling, help with ethics, a lot of these people haven't experienced that stuff. They haven't gone down this road. So for them to, well, again, some of them are really good photographers and they're all right, but when it comes to, like, gear using it the same way you're going to use it, if you're not going to use it to do, like, be a YouTuber or you're not doing, like, a random story that they do or calling themselves a documentary photographer because like once a year they go and film themselves like 90% of the time and 10% of the time doing like a story or what they call a story you know it's not the same thing look to those people about gear look to those people about process business style all that stuff if you want to do what they're doing if you want to be a YouTuber fine you know uh, mimic, mimic them or learn from them and understand what they're doing I still in that regard still think that you should become your own person that's why I haven't done the colored LED light in the background I do have a, some LED lights because I have my Apple Home Kit at my house but you're not going to see a blue tint over there, purple. I'm not going to get like that. I'm going to use gobos because I haven't seen a lot of people use gobos. So I'm the gobo guy. i got my own thing. See? One step ahead of the game. Doing my own stuff. Got another light over there, another light over here. None of them are those little, like, uh, colored hue lights. I mean, I do have hue lights in my house, but they're all amber or white. You're not going to see these fancy colors. You're not going to do it. I'm not going to be that guy. So that, that's the difference. I just think, you know, a lot of them out there like to say, it's like Steve McCurry, right? He liked to stay, say that he's a photojournalist because it sounded cool. And a lot of these YouTube photographers like to say they were, not say, but they hint at like doing assignment work, client work, and it's different. You know, if they're dealing with clients for sponsorships, fine, but that's a different relationship. That's a different way of teaching, a different understanding. If you're out there dealing with a client as a photographer is paying you to a photo shoot, they don't have that experience. Or most of them don't. Some of them do, okay. But most of them don't, you know, and they like to hint that they do. The same way, like I said, that Steve McCurry likes to hint that he was a photojournalist or tease that or, you know, not saying it, but you're working. He did say it, and he was working for a magazine that is doing journalism. So, yeah, BS. A lot of it's BS. So that's the hypocrisy in the industry. That's my wrap up there, guys. If you want to know more about this topic, you can check out the two articles I put. One's from the Business Insider, one's from uh, Peter Pixel. I'll put those in the comment section so you can check those Check those links out. We can still continue this debate for those of you that want to talk about it. Again, vulgar comments not accepted. Honest debate or, you know, have a different perspective, fine. Put that out there. Don't be scared. I encourage a dialogue. I think it's important to talk about this stuff. You know, sorry again that this was late in the beginning, you guys. I really was an idiot. Again, full transparency because that's the theme today is I recorded for 20 minutes like an idiot and it was not live. So... I have this great video. <laughs> watch. I'm like, why are there no comments? I thought people were tuning in. That's it for today, guys. Have a wonderful evening for my friends in the U.S. And good morning to my people out in Southeast Asia or people that are watching this not live the next day. Again, check this out. Share it. Get it out there. I think it's important to have this debate. Watch the video that I mentioned before, my video from last night. It's a lot shorter and it's a lot easier to digest. But if you want me to talk more about this or you have any questions, again, ask in the comment section. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. For those of you interested in one-on-one -on -one learning, you can check that out at justamont.com, all that kind of stuff. Thank you, guys. Love you guys. Thank you for giving me the confidence and for, you know, I, didn't, I mean, I was doing so smooth and then I just messed up. But thank you for giving me the confidence to put this out there. I do feel safe with you guys. I do feel like this is a good community of good people that share similar values and I appreciate that. So bye for now. I should do my official ending. And don't forget to have a wonderful day. I'm out. Bye, guys.